Hello, I'm here at Auckland University where I'm about to listen to a talk about Gaza by the young independent British journalist Harry Fear. I was lucky enough to catch up with Harry whilst he was preparing. If by the time I'm 50 or 60, I want to be in a similar position to John Pilger to be able to make documentaries like he does with the same level of infrastructure support and audience that he has, then I better start now. Because, I mean, he, John Pilger started very young in the media business. I think it was when he was less than 15, he was already, you know, writing articles for newspapers, local newspapers. So it was. I felt it really necessary to kick off doing really big things straight away, or try, I mean in terms of going to a war zone, that I guess is a big thing. What the dynamic of the conflict actually is, that of ethnic cleansing, state terrorism, and land and resource theft. And this uh, image does a very good job at communicating simply what actually has happened in the last 65 years. Uh, if you go back to 1917 or 1946, for example, you can see that the whole, what Western Christians usually call the Holy Land, is Palestinian. It's the Palestinian entity. 1947, following World War II, the United Nations proposed a repartition plan uh, facilitating the creation of a three-part non-contiguous Israeli state with a contiguous majority Palestinian state continuing. That's the black bit on the second map. When I'm working in Gaza, I basically work as a one-man team with various kind of bolt-ons. So when I first went to Gaza, I worked basically alone with the help of some people who were helping me translate, fix, produce, uh, and etc. Basically my friends. But now I have people in Gaza who I've now established a filming relationship with in the sense that um, I kind of, if you like, have a mini team in Gaza. Um, but it's, it's not like in any way like contractual or professional, it's just relationships with friends and stuff like this. This video is less than a minute long, but as I said, this lasted for seven days and three hours and the bombardment was basically continuous every minute, if not more in frequency, for that period of time. I was able to go because there was a change in the status of that crossing with Egypt, which facilitated internationals to go. At the same time, my friends in Gaza and Israel were saying, you should go to Gaza. And I thought, well, I'm already making documentaries in the UK about Gaza, about Israel, about Palestine. Well, I might as well actually just go to Gaza and make some. But generally, my interest in the conflict uh, between Israel and Palestinians so-called conflict, more like occupation and tragedy, is the fact that it's an injustice and that's what I care about in my work. So I try to address injustices of all kinds in my general portfolio, so to speak, in the sense that before I went to Gaza and things hit off with Gaza like they have now, I was making documentaries about Islamophobia through to Gitmo, Iraq War, Tony Blair, all this sort of stuff. And it's the same with my future, I hope, that it'll be equally balanced in respect of looking at issues from uh, environmentalism or rather specifically climate change to looking at the uh, situation in Afghanistan. I was going to say the war in Afghanistan, it's basically not even a war again, it's more of an occupation. Um, and these sorts of issues which continue to dominate uh, our world actually. What did Israel actually achieve? Basically uh, some bloodletting. And the military objective of Israel was to dent um, or destroy the personnel infrastructure and military capacity of the Hamas terror organization, something which was totally counterproductive. Hamas was strengthened by the recent war. The Palestinian resistance groups, terrorist groups, were strengthened by the recent war. The will of the Palestinian people was only strengthened having been subjected to this another episode of barbaric state terrorism. So totally strategically counterproductive from Israeli state's point of view. And are you going to stay independent? Um, yeah, I'm absolutely sure that I will stay independent because, um, I mean, I started off independent for a re really good reason, <laughs> because I don't want to work for a corporation and I don't want to have any kind of editorial control. And in my experience of not being independent, which I have done briefly, um, 
it, it's actually, it is literally psychologically not possible to be independent under corporate conditions. If you get paid, it's not possible. And so it's absolutely important to me to be independent. And actually, this is one of the, the things which facilitates my work, is that I'm very open about my personality, I'm very open about where I go, why I go, I'm very open about my skills, I'm very open about... Um, why I'm doing this and how I see the conflict, how I see the world and therefore I call myself a people's foreign correspondent um, because I feel like I'm owned by my viewers. Um, so for me this is a very organic and eth ethically clean way of doing it actually. So but you're young enough for your parents to be worried about you. Mm. So how do you deal with that? For my parents this is a terrible situation at one level which is that during the recent eight day war in November um, they really suffered as a result of me being in that situation. And at that time, last summer, 2012, it wasn't safe, actually. I mean, to be honest with you, it's much safer now than it was then. Um, in the sense that back then you could have a random airstrike coming out of nowhere in any part of the strip and you, you, you wouldn't have any protection, basically. You know, whenever you left the, the safest area, you were in danger, basically becoming collateral damage. Um, and when I was there last summer, innocent men, women, children killed in that way. So it was dangerous. It was the fact that what risks is he willing to take? How far is he willing to put himself in really in real danger to do what he thinks he needs to do? And whether or not they're able to psychologically deal with that, trust me to make that decision. So it was a two-tier thing in this, in this respect. I mean, I chose to go to Gaza by myself. I chose to go put myself in danger. I chose to work alone to make these video reports by myself. I just happened to be there when the war was there and it facilitated a larger audience in respect of my work because people were like, oh, who's this Brit stuck in Gaza doing this reporting? Oh, look, he's been doing this for a while, but we didn't know about him. So they're very proud of me um, and they, they, are, they are very supportive. And, you know, I'm only doing this because of them. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't put myself in a war zone if I hadn't had the sort of upbringing which taught principles of compassion and actions speak louder than words and etc. So it's, it's basically my parents, but their one child offspring is doing what, yeah, one child, so... Yeah. <laughs> Oh that compounds it, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, um, how do you... How, <laughs> yeah, good yes. point.